This is 21st Century Reformation at 21STCR.org. Anthony, uh, you know, uh, we were saying, I'm not certain, I guess we're not certain who wrote Hebrews, but whoever it was has my respect. It's an amazing, <laughs> you know, in, in the resurrection, I want to sit down with this person yeah. and, and talk with them about, you know, what inspired them and how they, they got so involved in all this. Sure. But it's wonderful, wonderful. Mm. Uh, wonderful material. Very intense. Very yeah. deep. I love the way at the end he said, I've written just this little short exhortation. Put up with me. <laughs> you know, just a short track. <laughs> it's an immensely profound piece. Yeah, it's wonderful stuff. I, did. I really love it. Well, shall we uh, undertake the 10th chapter? This is, this is mm -hmm. too good. Verse 1 For the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of things, can never by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise would they not have ceased to be offered because the worshippers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had consciousness of sins. Wow. <laughs> but in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins year by year. So he's He's saying that there was a problem associated with um, the sacrifices of the law that evidently they were not sufficient for actually uh, taking away the sins of the people because every year they are reminded of the sins of the people. It's not a... Uh, right, it wasn't a permanent thing, was it? Yeah. The contrast here is between the two covenants. Yeah. Although bulls and goats did something. You had to, you had to offer them. They gave you some release. Sure. Of, of guilt, but not in the ultimate sense. Right. Is that it's hard for us to conceive of this, Dan, isn't it? Because we, we're not used to the idea of taking lambs and sacrificing right, them right. Da daily, or even annually on the day yeah. of atonement. Yeah. But the point is that the ultimate sacrifice is only in Jesus. Yes. The substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus is ultimate. So he's drawing our attention, this writer's drawing our attention to that the insufficiency, I guess we would yes. say, of those sacrifices which they made, but the fact that they had to be regularly, perpetually made, demonstrates that their effectiveness uh, in in uh, dealing with sin was uh, was not. Uh, it wasn't ultimate. Was it? Wasn't the final thing? We're waiting for Christ to mm. offer Himself. This is the whole whole business of the old covenant being a shadow, isn't it? Mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. shadow word uh, that you just read in ten one reminds me immediately of Colossians two sixteen and ah, seventeen, yes, where yes. the Sabbath, the holy days, and the new moons, the whole of the Jewish calendar, is a shadow. People don't understand that. Mm -hmm. They're forever wanting to go back to the shadow. Right. They're not content somehow with the fullness of faith, the simplicity of faith. Oh, if I can just get the right holy water to cross myself with, <laughs> if I can just keep the right day, if I can just pronounce God's name mm, mm, correctly in Hebrew, that's a very immature form of faith. Mm, mm. Those things are not necessary. I can not have shrimp, you know, ever. Well, okay, in Leviticus 11 it does say that, but this is not the point in the new covenant, and people need to move from the legalism of the old, I think, to the freedom that we have now in Christ. Well, you know, this writer has chosen the word shadow, in expressing that, but uh, and uh, the shadows is not a place where I think one would want to live. <laughs> you know, you don't really want to live in the shadows. You're going to come on out in the in the light of the day. Exactly. And, uh, maybe maybe this is an example. If you if you were out and uh, walking along and you came across a shadow laying out uh, on the field or you know on. Uh, uh, and you and you study the shadow, and you look at the shadow. It gives you maybe a rough outline Absolutely. of something, Absolutely. and you can stand and look at the shadow, and look at the shadow, and think about it. And maybe gives you some concept, understanding of what the real object is. But once you have turned and you see the real object, the shadow itself really doesn't mean so much anymore. Now we've got the real thing. The shadow is helping us, perhaps, to picture something. But when we turn and we yeah. see the real object, the real, say it's a tree, now we're looking at this tree, yeah. now we can see it for what it really is. Exactly. And, uh, you know, after that, yeah, we, we were, it was nice to have a shadow till we were able to see the real mm -hmm. thing, but now that the real thing is here, 
Let's go for it. You used the word sketch, and that's exactly right. It's an outline, a sketch. But why do you want to go back to the sketch when you've got the reality? Now we have the reality. And yes. He's got that very word in 10.1 there. Uh, they were a shadow. The law, the Torah taken as a whole, the letter, that is, of the Torah, is only a shadow of the things that have now come and are still coming. The future mm -hmm. things, i.e. future to the time of the Torah being given. And not the very icon, not the very image. Of not the, the real not item the itself. Right. Yes, yeah. So the tendency in contemporary religion is to divide all the time by going back to various elements of Torah. You then start a new denomination. Now you've got people who have to meet on a Saturday, not a Sunday. You've got people who cannot ever have pork to eat. Well, those are matters of conscience, and we should treat people like that with gentleness. But it's a form of immaturity. Mm -hmm. And this writer is saying... For goodness sake, forget the shadow and move into the fullness of freedom as the book of Galatians also does so well. Well, it's kind of interesting too, and I like what you were saying about uh, uh, this, this matter of immaturity because I think it's easy for the person who is, is intent on doing the law yes. uh, or uh, following in that, in that way to picture themselves as being mature. Yes. I'm mature because I do this. I'm mature because I'm keeping this. I'm mature. And you're not if you don't. That's right. And actually, they, they've turned uh, spirituality on its head about that point because the maturity is coming to the reality yes. and leaving the shadow right. for what it was. That's for what right. it, it was a shadow of right. good things to come. But not the real thing. Not the, the form, as you say. Not the icon. Not the or, icon. Isn't yeah. it? It's beautiful. I well, think we could, we could talk much about this because our contemporary theological scene is plagued mm. by this feeling, well, if I haven't got something concrete like Sabbath keeping or food laws or new moons, mm. and I've heard mm. people say, we're keeping the new moons now and we're so <laughs> close to God. And I'm thinking, but what is your neighbor saying as you stare at the new moon every month? You're making that then the substance of faith mm. and you're, you're not anymore a very normal person to the world. You're not advertising the faith well. Mm -hmm. If you're making it more of a burden to be a Christian, Yes, and that's yes. a very important issue for Paul and for this writer. Well, and and then uh, pursuing those things that were in the shadows yeah. of or the shadow. Yeah, uh, I think Paul is not seeing as being a uh, a harmless matter. Or it, actually, he's looking at it from the standpoint of Galatians five and one. Yeah. He he he's as our uh, as our King James says, it's an entanglement. He don't yes. be entangled with all of this. Keep clear of it. Exactly. Uh, don't be entangled again with this yes. this yoke of bondage. It's right. Uh, it's which right. was that law. Yes. Uh, in in the very unpopular text in some circles in Acts Acts fifteen, actually the council there, where Peter himself says, Why are you putting a burden on our people mm. which even they couldn't bear? Yes. And you hear, Oh, the Torah is so wonderful. Yes, it is, but it was burdensome in some sense, mm -hmm. as Peter admits that. Mm -hmm. So we need unity, I think, will come when we're united on a few very simple truths, not cluttered, not entangled, to use your word, uh, with mixing the old with the new. We don't want to do that. Verse 4. And now I think he really drives this point home about the, uh, the issues of the sacrifices. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have taken no pleasure. Verse 7. Then I said, Behold, I have come, in the scroll of the book it is written of me, to do your will, O God. Verse 8. Mm -hmm. After saying above, sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Wow. Wow. That's Profound. amazing stuff. Yes, isn't it? It's interesting. He, he sees Jesus in the Psalms here, quoting the Psalms, and the I have come is a messianic prophecy. It doesn't mean that Jesus, the Son, was alive when the Psalms were written, but they are prophetic of Jesus. Mm. So he's able to quote the Psalms as though Jesus is speaking. I think it's important to point out that when he comes into the world, in verse 5, Dan, that means when he was born. Of course. Because yeah. people read the capital incarnation there. They've got a God, the Son, 
who is putting on human nature and coming in a human body, but isn't really a there's full no, person. There's not really a word of that in what he just not said here. No, we read that into it. Yeah. And I think the key then would be verse 9. Behold, I have come to do your will. Not my physical body has come, yes. but Mary just produced a shell. Yeah. No, a person. So coming into the world is to be born in verse 5. And he's come, and John the Baptist also was sent. He came, so it's nothing to do with a right. literal pre-existence. I love that. I've come to do your will, is the word of Messiah in verse 9. And he takes away, presumably we're talking about the first covenant, the old course, legal yeah. system. Based Which on is his context letter. here. The covenant okay. has been what That's he's been right. talking about in the 8th the chapter and, and the ninth. So we do have a change of Torah here. Mm -hmm. That's very hard for some. Mm -hmm. They think the Torah is inviolate. It cannot be changed ever. And the fact is it moves from the letter to the spirit. And that is a change, isn't it? That's the key to this. When it says, um, I have come in verse 7, and in verse 5, a body you have prepared for me. People misread that to mean that a pre-existing God, the Son, entered a human body. The key would be, though, that this is the sacrifice of Jesus himself. And that's 9.26 of Hebrews says, that he's been manifested, Jesus has been manifested, to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. himself the whole person the is The whole person the sacrifice. is sacrificed. Otherwise we get in this hair-splitting arguments about, well, the God part didn't die and the man part. <laughs> yes. And that, at that point we enter into the world of madness and, and, and confusion and difficulty. No. Quite unnecessary. In Hebrew thinking, we always must insist on a psychosomatic unity. Mm -hmm. A self is, uh, is offered in sacrifice, not just a body... You can, you can uh, uh, and it is the case then that uh, when we say Jesus died for our sins, we're not saying Jesus' body died for our sins. That's right. Jesus, the whole person, That's really right. died. And his body, of course, died in, in that process. Indeed, the Son of God sure. died, Paul says. The yes. Son of God. The Son, the Son of God. God is supposed to be the divine, the deity part of him. That's not going to work <laughs> uh, if you don't think the deity can... Unless you think the deity can die, and of course that's another uh, can of worms. We don't want to open that one. But certainly the Son of God died. This is not difficult in the Bible until you start complicating and confusing. Right. And that happened in post-biblical times, mm -hmm. not in the Bible itself. You know, Anthony, I like this uh, uh, verse 10 again. By this uh, will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Uh, I think, uh, again, the contrast with the sacrifices under the law, what we really are seeing here is a fundamental change in the issues of sacrifice. The sacrifices that were under the law, we're now understanding, could never take away sin. We now have the introduction of a sacrifice that does accomplish the, uh, the taking away of sins, which those that were given under the law could never do. And isn't this a fundamental shift then in oh, our huge. thinking, our faith, and the issues of, uh, of... And again, what were the sacrifices under the law? It was part of the shadow, I would think. Would, would that not be oh, what this writer's picturing? Right. Uh, we're looking at shadows. We're looking at the sacrifices of the law. We're shadows of what? This time, the, the real thing is the, the, the giving of Jesus Christ, giving his life, his blood, his body, uh, in, uh, for the benefit and the sake of the people. It's hard for us to imagine, I think, the extent of that shift, isn't it? Because we haven't, we were not living in that time. But if there is an analogy, it might be something like integration. Mm. You know, the shocking idea that different races could eat in the same restaurant. It, absolutely radical, absolutely shocking. It took a revolution. Now we're used to that. Mm. It seems absurd, doesn't it, that we would, that we would uh, be against another race. Surely because of the skin color. Surely. It's the same thing here. We're talking about a revolution. The idea that the Torah can be in any way modified, spiritualized, is anathema to a Torah-believing person. And Paul is having to say, or the writer here is having to say, this is once and for all, isn't it? Yeah. It's not repeated. It's once it, and for all now. Yeah. And you know, um, again, the fact that this represents fundamental changes, shifting in the whole issues about law, uh, uh, from uh, the the Torah of Moses, if you will, to the Torah of Messiah, which is a different a different law, if you yes. will. Uh, but uh, the ri yeah. same writer in the seventh chapter, we uh, we noted earlier, uh, and I think it's, it's great to note. He talks about the shift in the priesthood, exactly, and he is telling us in the seventh chapter uh, that the Levitical priesthood uh, was not. 
impossible for it to continue. These, these folks kept dying and it, there was uh, weakness problems, issues there. Uh, then he comes along and says, now we have Jesus coming on the scene and we see that he is from a tribe of which nothing was said in the law about priesthood. And yet here he is. He is our priest. He is our high priest. And I love the statement that he says in verse 12 of the 7th chapter, for when the priesthood is changed of necessity, there takes place a change of law also. Wow. You're going to shift some of these things, right. then the, the whole issue, when you're going to change priesthoods, we also are changing laws. We're, we're, going, yeah, we're taking on a new, a new uh, program yeah, here. Exactly right. Yeah. No, I'm glad you mentioned that, because that's unheard of, that somebody could be a priest who is not of the tribe of Levi. Mm. And that's yeah. just radical. That's heresy. Yeah. Impossible, Impossible under the law. Impossible idea. Yeah. But here, here it is. And, and you said 714 of Hebrews. I use this as a memory device in, in the classroom. 714 of Hebrews says, We know that our Lord, Messiah, mm -hmm. is descended from Judah. Well, 714 in Isaiah is a virgin will conceive. <laughs> yes. And 714 in Second Samuel is, I will raise up a son. I'll have a son <laughs> who's going to be the Messiah. God's speaking there. Mm -hmm. Isn't that marvelous? 714. 714. Very much the a royal great, number seven. A, a great One. memory device. I love that. It's a memory device. Right. I don't know if it means anything <laughs> profoundly, but it's certainly like interesting. That. That's right. But you're absolutely right to stress that because only a Levite could be a priest. Mm. And here you've got a priesthood after the order of Melchizedek from Psalm 110, yes. verse 4. Verse 4. Of course, that Psalm 110 is the framework around which the whole of this book, in, indeed the whole New Testament, is really built. Verses 1 and yeah. 4 and probably verse 3 from the Septuagint also. So, yeah, we couldn't get more fundamental than saying the Torah can be changed. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that wonderful phrase, the Torah of Messiah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Paul says, I'm not under the law. I'll be under the law, you know, if it makes you feel happy, I'll keep the Sabbath with you, I'll, I'll do this and that to accommodate you. I'll even get uh, Timothy circumcised because of the Jews mm -hmm. as an accommodation to them, to their weakness. But this is radical stuff. When you move the priesthood from one tribe to another, I mean, you're asking for a huge then, change. Then the former program no longer can uh, exist in it. In that, in that. Right. Uh, so we've we have changed uh, priesthoods. Yeah. Shifted it entirely. Yes. We have now shifted our the entire picture regarding yeah. sacrifices. Uh, yeah. This writer is showing us that you can't make these kinds of changes without also changing, not just changing the old law, but changing to a new law, a new system, a new program, right. of which the, the old law said nothing. It said nothing about right. a, a priest from uh, Judah. It, it said nothing about uh, the, the Son of God being the sacrifice. Mm -hmm. This new program mm -hmm. is what tells us these things. So we're not just changing, changing the law, the old law, or fixing it or changing it around something, we're actually shifting from it to an entirely new program, right. God's program, the program that God really had in mind the entire right. time. The other was just a shadow right. coming in for a yeah. time, then, would you say? Yeah. Absolutely right. And the interesting thing then, too, is that the Old Testament foresees this. You're right. The law has gone in its letter form mm -hmm. as a schoolmaster, a temporary schoolmaster, but even Psalm 110.1 and other passages foresaw a new system mm, when speaking mm. of the Messiah being of the order of Melchizedek, no, kids, uh, yes, which yes, is a yes. brand new idea. So in a beautiful way, then, the Old Testament predicts the new, doesn't it? Yes, yes. But you're right, the change of Torah, and that's a, uh, that's a Hebrews phrase. Mm -hmm. We have a change of Torah. Mm. I want people to face that because if you're stuck in the Old Torah, you're not getting the benefits yeah. of the spiritual Torah and, and we're missing all these wonderful truths yes. that uh, we have to. We're, right. we're, we're darkening our minds with regard to the power and the glory and the wonder right. of these, this new program. That's right. Because we're still caught trying to live out That's right. that preliminary program, the, the program that was really a, a preface, if you will. That's most this. interesting to me, Dan. Would you, I think we would agree, too, that you're also dividing the church because when you mm. have so-called biblical Unitarians, people who are saying God is really one. That's mm. very Jewish. Mm -hmm. That's from Jesus himself. That's sure. fine. That's valid. That hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. The God of the Jews is the God of the Gentiles. That hasn't changed. Who God is doesn't let's, let's change. Let's not change in, that. <laughs> that never changes. That's but if we're still insisting on some of those ways of life, those practices which are old covenant, we are starting a new denomination. Mm -hmm. We're dividing the church because sure. people will say, well, these things don't matter really. 
You try organizing a local church when people cannot agree on what day the resurrection was. <laughs> yes. You've immediately got confusion and division. Mm -hmm. And we don't want that. We want the simplicity of one God, one Messiah, one kingdom gospel. And the rest is good, honest, upright, sexual purity being very important Surely. as law. But not these Jewish ways of life. Sure. Confusing them with the new covenant. And recognizing that our teacher... Our instructor is not Moses. That's right. It is Jesus. And, uh, and the words know, of Jesus. Uh, surely. Yes, Indeed. that's it. Verse 11. Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. Yes. Oh my goodness. There's our Psalm 110 and 1, isn't it? Sure, yeah. this is, this is uh, somebody said it's the star witness. I like that. <laughs> the star witness text. If everybody would commit themselves to studying Psalm 110 verse 1, <laughs> seeing it's a star witness text for the whole of the New Testament. Umbrella, right? Tremendous. Because it has God, one, Yahweh. It has Adonai, my Lord Messiah, at the right hand, waiting, as we're going to be reading here, waiting until his enemies mm -hmm. are going to be made, so, so, which lies yet in the future. Yes. So then verse 13 is mm. waiting from that mm -hmm. time onward mm -hmm. until mm. his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering, verse 14, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws upon their heart, and on their mind I will write them. He then says, verse 17, yes. And their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Verse 18, And where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. Yes. Wow. Wonderfully simple and clear. I think then the system which insists on the Mass being a repetition of the sacrifice would have to fall under condemnation here, would it not? We don't need, we don't, we don't need to be worrying then about a continuous offering for sin. It's all been done. I think this is very healthy psychologically, don't you, that we can say, yes, we're not perfect, we're maturing. We do make mistakes. We have to repent of those sins as we go forward. But the ultimate sacrifice has now been made. It's in the past on our behalf. Very exciting. I like your point about uh, uh, in the Mass, uh, mm -hmm. we have the thought that we are uh, seeing afresh Jesus uh, and his sacrifice week after week after week after week. It seems entirely contrary to what this writer is really conveying to us. That's, right. that's, that's not what needs to happen at all. Right. We have one sacrifice for sins for all time. Certainly. And we're not looking to repeat that, it's but remembering repetition. it and the, uh, an assumed Definitely. repeating it That's are two very different Absolutely. things. Yeah. Uh, yes. But then also all the way back to his key thought, and that is the sacrifice of the law, mm. that system, that program, uh, was one in which we're talking about repeating the sacrifices over and over again and over again, Absolutely. which to this writer, he's saying, doesn't that point to their insufficiency? And uh, But Jesus Christ gave himself once for all, for all. And, and that's it. This is, very easy. you can't improve on it. You no. can't, tell, you shouldn't diminish it. It is, right. it's everything. Refreshing and that's this new program. Absolutely. It's not anything the law knew anything about in itself. Uh, you know, that's, why that's right. There is this little point that we're being sanctified there. It says we're sanctified. My note has that right. The present possible there in the Greek. We are in process of ah, being yes, made of holy. It doesn't happen in one day, but as we move forward towards the goal of the kingdom, we're being made holy through the Holy Spirit. We should comment, the Holy Spirit is not a third person uh, yes. in Scripture. Very personal, I would say, because it's the Spirit of God or Jesus, mm -hmm. indistinguishably. Uh, but not a third person. The Holy Spirit never sends any greetings. The Holy Spirit is never worshipped. That's interesting. Never prayed to. And yet it's very personal. So I think it must be then the operational presence and power. Very personal. That's coming from the center of God and Jesus. Their personality is extended. That's easier. And it was only, you know, uh, even at Nicaea in 325, 
that they were uncertain about the Holy Spirit. Sure. People forget that. There was no fixed and ready-made, complete Trinitarian thing in the New Testament. Far from it. Even in 385, Dan, the Church Father said, some of us don't know what the Spirit is. We're not sure. We, mm -hmm. Some think third person. It's complete nonsense mm -hmm. to think there was a completely formed, tailor-made, Trinitarian dogma within the pages of the New Testament. That's simply wrong. Simply not there. Uh, the, uh, and... Uh when we're thinking about the Spirit of God, and uh, which Jesus speaks of as being the Spirit of the Father, uh, the Father's Spirit, mm. uh, His personal Spirit, Indeed. when you're saying that, that the Spirit said something, or the Spirit did something, or the Spirit inspired something, it really is another way of saying the Father Himself oh, right. said something, inspired something, did yes. something. Right in his presence, in That's his right. presence to work. And, exactly. And, and then right. uh, with Messiah, now at the right hand of God and having, uh, Matthew 28, 18, been given uh, all power and great authority, he also can operate through that same spirit. But it's a, not a non-personal spirit in, in, in any way you look at it. It's, it is a very personal matter. When, you're, uh, when we're talking about the Spirit of God, it's not an impersonal spirit. It is the Father himself. That's Indeed. the person that Indeed. we're talking about here. Yeah. yeah, one way of putting that to your friends is to say, do you think the spirit of Elijah is a different person from Elijah? Ah, yes. you know, that's the John the Baptist. He came yeah. in the same mode, the same yeah. mood, yeah. the same disposition and attitude as Elijah did. Well, now, is that spirit of Elijah a different person from people say well no okay so then is the spirit of god or indeed the spirit of jesus in Acts 16 yeah, sure indeed the spirit of jesus in Acts 16 is that a different person from jesus well no mm -hmm. common sense would suggest it's god and jesus operating it's how we experience them now they are located somehow in heaven but their operational presence and part very personal mm -hmm. and so the accusation you know, that we think that the spirit is just a force coming out of an electric socket that's just false that's a straw man i don't believe that for a minute i think the spirit is very personal indeed i do not think there's enough evidence for a third person and even daniel wallace in his famous uh, there's a famous article by the great uh, contemporary grammarian daniel wallace where he says there is not enough grammatical evidence for a third person in Scripture. That paracletos, that comforter in John, is not necessarily a third person. It's Jesus as operating in our presence and working in and through us. And throughout the Old Testament, we're talking about it being the Father operating through uh, his prophets and yeah. through the people yeah. and for the people. There is a personality in the spirit, but the personality is not a third person. No. The personality is the Father Himself, That's right. and hence it is the Spirit of the Father. Right. Or by the glory and power of God, yeah. when Christ has now been enthroned in heaven at the right hand of God, He also can function and operate through the Spirit of God, exactly. and uh, and uh, as in as you mentioned in Acts 16. That's yes, I, I found that very beautiful. In fact, I sat in a meeting where some large denomination was trying to become more strongly Trinitarian. <laughs> and somebody raised the question, well, why doesn't the Spirit send any greetings? Yeah. Why isn't the Spirit prayed to or worshipped? And, and they said, well, the Spirit is a shy member of the trio, <laughs> in all seriousness. And I think this points to the absurdity to which we drive ourselves in an attempt to defend the status quo, for goodness sake. Is there no room for reformation? Couldn't we go back at least to 385 and say, even in 385, the Church Fathers weren't settled on this? Okay. 385 AD, and they're still not no, certain there's no, a third person. No, there's a, yeah. <laughs> try. Just don't need it. Yeah. Right. yeah, I think it's important for us to stress, Dan, that the, the covenant there in verse 16 is the new covenant. Mm. Now, there are some who say that has to be made first with Israel and Judah in the future. Mm. That's certainly true. In Jeremiah 31, you are going to have a renewal of the new covenant with the, what we might call now natural, national Israel. But if we say that this is not made with the church now, we're in great difficulty because Paul called himself a minister of the, new, the new covenant, covenant. Yeah, right, yeah. and he's, this is, is applying in the Jeremiah passage in verse 16 there from mm -hmm. Jeremiah 31, 33 he's applying it plainly mm -hmm. to our situation now so mm -hmm. the church the international Israel of God I would call them the international spiritual circumcision Philippians 3, 3 is already in place we're the sort of advanced guard then of an international united one faith hopefully which is the New Covenant. Wonderful. Well, and aren't we, Anthony, getting a picture here from this writer, and, and Paul, of course, as well, but 
that the difference between the the one law and this new law, mm -hmm. it's not just that you're taking the old law and now going to write it on somebody's heart. Exactly. This is not, it's not that simple. The old law is, uh, the writer has described it in the last of the eighth chapter, yeah. is something that's passing away. We're talk, when you talk about something being old, then you're talking about something that is fading on out, going away. So it's not that we're going to write the old one on people's hearts and therefore somehow it's a new law. You're actually writing God's law, but it will be this new program here. He's, he's developing a picture where we have actually a new program, new law, uh, with a very different new priesthood, new sacrifice, sacrificial system, and so we're not talking about, oh, we'll just take the old one and write it on their hearts now, because maybe it wasn't on their hearts, but we're going to actually write a new program, and this one's going to be written on their hearts in a sense that I think the old program was not. Certainly. So your point is, is an excellent one. It's not just a repetition of the letter of the law now in the heart. Mm -hmm. It's a new Torah. It's the it's Torah of Messiah. Program. Yes. And even Jesus hinted at that. There are some passages in Matthew 12, a uh, section in Matthew 12 there, where he says, haven't you seen, haven't you read how David was able to eat the showbread and ah, be yes, yes. innocent? Haven't you read that there were priests who ministered on a Sabbath day and were innocent. Were blameless, yes. They weren't under the Sabbath law as priests in the Old Testament when they were ministering in the temple, and are greater than the temple is here, he says. Mm. He's hinting there at something new. Surely. Which goes beyond the letter of the law. The key is the letter and the spirit, isn't it? Mm. We do believe in the spirit of the law, not the letter of the law. Oh, here's the classic way of putting this to your friends. Circumcision is plainly in the flesh in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. In Genesis 17, Every Jew and every Gentile who becomes part of the covenant must be physically circumcised. Now, it's evident that Paul taught the opposite, isn't it? And so some people have taken it upon themselves to say that Paul was a false prophet. <laughs> yes. I understand their point, because Paul is contradicting flat the letter of the Torah. Surely. Can you do that? Surely. Well, a Jew cannot do that. Paul was a true prophet of the new covenant. And so we've moved, as you said, a vast shift, mm -hmm. a radical shift mm -hmm. from the letter to the spirit. Mm -hmm. And getting that distinction worked out is the practical problem I think we're facing in churches today. Yes. Well, again, when we're looking at the letter in that sense, we're actually studying the shadows, I think. And what, what we're being asked to do is this was all a shadow of that true form, the real thing. And now we have the real thing, and I think uh, uh, that this writer is telling us this is a new program, and it's one to be uh, that far excels the old program and uh, supplants it, if you will. And now it's going to be written in the hearts of, of God's people. It's wonderful. It's the fulfillment of the law, that uh, famous thing where Jesus said, "Don't imagine I came to destroy the law, but I did come to fill it." full. Mm, mm. A classic example of that would be the Isaiah 7, 14, a virgin will conceive. The word there is a little ambiguous. Mm -hmm. A young lady is going to have a baby. Mm -hmm. In the time of Ahaz, that would work well. Mm -hmm. But what Matthew is seeing is that, that was literally a virgin in its fulfilled mm -hmm. occurrence. Yes, this yes. is a rehearsal, a, a mini rehearsal. <laughs> the right. real thing, the fulfilling of the law, came only in Jesus. So Matthew then divides his, his book into five blocks. The new Torah, the new Moses. And that virgin, that could be just a young lady in the time of Ahaz, is a parthenos in mm -hmm. the Greek. He's quoting the section. He's yeah. making his point. Yeah. The final fulfillment, Surely. what you're talking about here yeah. in Hebrews, comes with only with Jesus and all the events of the new Absolutely. covenant. Radically different. A, an entirely new program. So different that you can only say that the earlier program was a shadow of it. That's right. Yeah. And the most radical of all, of course, is this thing in Mark seven nineteen Again, Jesus hinting at it. I don't think they understood when he said this, mm -hmm. but he's talking about washing your hands before eating and clean and unclean meats, yeah. clearly. Thus he said, cleansing all, all foods. foods. Yes, yes. That's a tough one. <laughs> the best manuscripts have that very clear. Uh, it's a grammatical issue in the Greek there. It's very clear. I don't think they understood that until later, but that's a mark and comment. Yes, a, a retrospective see? comment, I yes. would think. Oh, when he said this, yes. actually, he was yes. cleansing all yes. food. Yes. He didn't fully understand. understand. It would have yeah. been too much at that point. Yeah. But cannot people move beyond the letter of the law? Mm -hmm. It's a serious issue. Mm -hmm. Paul gets terribly anguished mm -hmm. about those who are 
constantly going back under Moses mm, mm. when Moses is a temporary schoolmaster. Mm. And, uh, and now that this faith has come, we're no longer under that's right. that, that schoolmaster. Yeah, that seems very clear to me. You know, clear to me now. I mean, I came from a background where I didn't understand that. I think that's why I feel uh, passionate about this, mm. because I know what life is like under the mosaic thing. And it's a very different kettle of fish from what I now experience of the freedom of Christ. Mm. It's not licensed to do exactly what I want to do, but it's not the letter of the law. And this book is devoted to this subject. Verse 19. Uh, this is great stuff, uh, Anthony. I'm loving it. The writer says, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, verse 22, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Verse 25, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Uh, so this is, I love, uh, it's, it's like he's bringing all this together, isn't it, in, this, uh, in these statements. If he begins this in verse 19, yes, uh, saying, let's have great confidence, enter into the holy place by the blood of Jesus. Uh, in this, and I love this, uh, uh, by a new and living way, not the old way, not a rework of the old way, but a really new way. And, uh, and it's a new and it's a living way, uh, which he inaugurated for us. So prior to its inauguration, this new program was not in place. This new program was not in effect. Uh, I, I would say in, in some ways it would be a fair consideration to say how much of the new program did the people under the Mosaic system live by? Well, they didn't live by a priest that was from the tribe of Judah. They, they knew they nothing died. about any of that. Absolutely. They didn't live according to this sacrifice of the Son of God, which is the way now we would enter into the true Holy of Holies, uh, the, uh, which he describes in another place as heaven itself, he says. Yes. And uh, so under the law, they weren't really living this new program. And they didn't have the new program. Under the new program, we're no longer under the old program, the preliminary system, the system that uh, was worked with to, uh, to bring That's this right. up. Does that uh, That makes very good sense. I think you're stressing what needs to be stressed here, that there's a radical discontinuity <laughs> between yes. the two systems. Uh, people have argued, no, it's a new covenant. It shouldn't be a new covenant. It should be a renewed covenant. Well, there are two Greek words. It's true. But both of them are used for the covenant. It's mm -hmm. both renewed, mm -hmm. because it's based on the faith made with Abraham, the covenant right. with Abraham, but it's also brand new. It's a mm -hmm. brand new thing. And so I think that cannot be overstressed today, because it's, again, this question of division. Mm -hmm. If you've got half of your congregation trying to move back under Moses and half not, I'm afraid you've not got the unity of the faith that Jesus prayed for, mm -hmm. that Paul insists on when he said, I want you brothers and sisters all to say the same thing. You'll be perfectly united in one mind and one judgment. Excuse me, 35,000 denominations. We aren't there yet, right? Mm. Unity is going to come when we agree that God is one, that Jesus is the Messiah, Son of God, mm. and we get hold of the simplicity of the new covenant as being described by this book. So uh, he's encouraging the people, saying, we have this new program, we have this new system. It was inaugurated by... Jesus Christ himself, when he yes. gave himself yes. uh, and, and, and yes. died for us. Yes. We draw, and this new program, this new system, we draw near to God by the blood of Jesus Christ. And, uh, and so he says, now let's hold fast uh, the confession of our hope without any wavering. I love that. 
great confidence here, isn't it, in the simplicity. The veil here would be the veil of the temple, the curtain, you know, was rent, Surely, yeah. rent in twain. He, right. King James uh, torn apart <clears throat> as he died. So that's where this entrance into the new system was inaugurated by the blood of the covenant, the covenant being based on the words and teachings of Jesus. Having got all the words straight, then you die to ratify that covenant. I see how that works. I find that very beautiful. And that is his flesh. That would be his human life. His human personality died. That inaugurated the new covenant through the blood. And it is a substitutionary death, mm. Dan, isn't it? I think so, yes. He's not just Clearly. dying as a good moral example. He does that too. It is very noble to die Surely. asking that your enemies be forgiven when they're killing you. Surely. That's all fine. But there's more to the sacrifice of Jesus than that. It's oh a substitutionary goodness, uh, uh, element. Is very clear that he's dying in our place. Anti, the, the right. Greek preposition, anti, meaning in our place, right. as a substitute for us. That sure. has to be insisted on because otherwise we're watering down the effect of the sacrifice. Yeah. Well, and the, and the power of this sacrifice and its effectualness for us is uh, very obvious in what this writer is saying. He, we're going to draw near to God. Yes by the blood of Jesus Christ. Sure. That's, that is uh, very mighty, the very powerful uh, uh, matter here. Right. I, I don't think we're going to draw near to God without that blood of Jesus no. Christ no. Having, uh, having been shed. And Not at all. This sacrifice whereby sins are once and for all being dealt with. You know, yes. that's, that's that sin does come. You will not survive in the universe if you are an unforgiven sinner. Is that right? Sin matters to God. You can put it this way. One adultery in Atlanta per year is much too much. Mm -hmm. One broken marriage, one tragic divorce is too much for God. Mm -hmm. He's not happy with that. Mm -hmm. His standards are quite different from ours. Yes. So I think the writer is pointing out the seriousness of sin here. That somebody had to die, had to shed his life and blood for sin. That's yes. most important. I think uh, that's exactly right, and it utterly makes sense. I, in fact, without that thought in place, I don't think you can make sense of uh, this writer yeah. uh, and the things that he's saying. Uh, that's right. As we've been reading this in, well, really, uh, all through the book of Hebrews. Wouldn't you say it requires a lot of meditation, by the way? It's not just a question of reading a verse, putting it on the fridge and hoping for the yeah, best. Sure. This is a very profound piece. It, it requires, requires thought. Yeah. Continuous reading, sure. I think extensive reading. I read two or three chapters at a time. Sometimes in preaching you're told to do one verse, most two verses, and then you do your fishing stories. I'm being sarcastic here. <laughs> no, you need to read extended passages of Scripture. I, right. I've often wondered, Dan, if the church one day, all the churches would say, let's quit for six months, close the doors, let's go home and read our Bibles, then we'll invite our pastors to read from the text of Scripture, say First Thessalonians, read it out. No comment, just read it out from a modern translation. Wow. And I think people get the idea quite well. Yeah. But we're so cluttered up with tradition, it makes it very hard for people to relate to these mm. original mm. Christian words here. It's interesting to me that uh, the writer sees all of the things he's been talking about, about this new program, this new and living way, which was inaugurated by Jesus Christ. He sees it all then as taking this form with the people he's writing to, and that is... Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves yes. together. Don't don't do that. Uh, encourage one another uh, to love and to good deeds. Come on, folks. Everything's on our side here. We've got God on our side because of Jesus Christ and what he's done. We have a whole new program, a new system. We're no longer living in the shadows of Moses' law. We're now living out in the day, in the, in the light of day, of this wonderful new and living way that Christ has inaugurated and brought us to. Absolutely. I think it's wonderful. And so the word hope there is, is key for me. In Colossians 1, Paul mentioned that hope is the foundation of love and faith. Mm, mm. So if your congregation is not very loving and not very faithful or demonstrating faith, how about the hope not being clear? Uh, that's a difficult verse for people, but he does say that faith and love are because of hope. Here you have our hope. You must clarify the hope. That they're not just hoping to die and play a harp on a pink cloud. That's not very interesting. We're going to get in the 11th chapter, you know, the object of our faith is to fix the world on a grand scale when Christ comes back. Mm. So hope has to be defined, and he's going to do it later in the book. Yeah, this idea of the day drawing near is typical of all the prophets of Israel. Expect the day of the Lord to come very soon. 
And, and of course, the theological truth in that is that we all are prone to death. We could die soon, and we need to be ready for the kingdom, even if it were thousands of years away. So there's really no problem here with his imminent expectation of the second coming of mm. Jesus. Verse 26. For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Verse 27, But a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Verse 29, How much severer punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God? and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, and has insulted the Spirit of grace. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. Verse 31, It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Well, this is very foreboding, isn't it? Very foreboding is a good adjective, yes. It is very much against the notion of once saved, always mm. saved. You mm. know, popular in some circles is the idea that you go to a get saved meeting, put up your hand. It wouldn't matter if you robbed a bank every day of the week. For the rest of your life, you'd still, quote, be saved. That cannot be true on this text and many other mm. if texts, right? You always have to hang in till the end. And this, as you said, is one of the more threatening, most threatening, perhaps, in the whole of the New Testament. It isn't universalism. I don't think it's an, uh, the idea that everybody gets saved, including the devil and the demons. <laughs> yes. It doesn't sound like that. It doesn't ring true. I would love that to be so, yeah. that God eventually saves everybody, come what may. You can allow for the wider hope in the second resurrection. All of that is fine. But this text is very threatening to those of us who have had their eyes open at least to some measure of truth. Mm. We're under the gun, are we not? I, I think so, and uh, there's no other way to rightly understand what this writer is, is saying to so. people. It's very, uh, he's not writing to outsiders, he's not no. writing to the non-Christians, right. he's writing to Christians. That's right. He's not writing to people who have never received this, this gospel. He's very clearly uh, inclusive as he's come down through here. We have been, he's saying, uh, we've got confidence uh, to enter the holy uh, place by the blood of Jesus. So this is this is the category of people he's talking to. He's saying we have now this new and living way that he has inaugurated for us uh, through the veil that is his flesh. So he's very much speaking to a Christian audience, and uh, and then these warnings then are very much directed to that Christian audience. It, it seems to me in verse 29 there's no question that he's saying uh, you, we're talking about a person here who would trample underfoot the Son of God uh, and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which this person has been sanctified. Clearly. And you have insulted the, the spirit of grace which you partaken of. Absolutely. So uh, if those things are impossible for a Christian to do, then this writer lost his mind about that thing. <laughs> I mean, there's just no sensibility to it at all. Absolutely right. And if the, if the judgments against a Christian doing these things are not true, yeah. then I'm afraid that the, the entire book of Hebrews is, is unreliable. We, can't, uh, we just can't trust it. To reinforce your point, chapter 6, the first uh, eight verses there uh, have exactly the same message, even more stark than, than what you're describing here, although it's quite final here, mm -hmm. uh, what you read. But in chapter 6 you have, if people have fallen away, having been enlightened, they're clearly oh. of Christian category here, they're not outsiders. If they fall away, it is impossible to renew them to repentance wow. because they're trampling underfoot the blood of the Savior. Yeah. I, I don't know what language could be used to be more descriptive than that, descriptive mm -hmm. than that because impossible is impossible. Mm -hmm. And so this is the unpardonable sin. Now, on the balance of that, one must say that many people have not been enlightened in the category described by our writer here. Mm -hmm. Would that be so? And so you may have a very partial understanding of the faith. You're not going to be committing the unpardonable sin unless you've got a full awareness of truth. You, you and so we need to deal pastorally with that system, with that situation, because you do find people who feel they've done something so bad 
that they can't ever be forgiven. And, and normally that means that they're seeking forgiveness and can find it, right? Well, you know, and Anthony, too, I was just thinking about the, the severity of what he's describing yes. here. We're talking about a person who has uh, uh, actually been sanctified, who has been made clean by yes. the blood of Jesus Christ and, yes. and has been blessed by the Spirit of grace, who now is trampling underfoot the Son of God, yeah. who, who's turning against this very means by which he was sanctified, this person was sanctified. If he turns against that, he turns against the Son of God, tramples underfoot the Son of God, uh, is uh, treating the blood by which he was sanctified as an, an unclean thing. This person has done something uh, that is uh, very severe in the sight of God. Apparently, I, I don't know how language could be clearer than that. Yeah. Uh, it's a terrible thing. Vengeance is mine then. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You get this phrase about God is a consuming fire. Mm. And so there's a, I love that text in Romans where Paul says, Behold the kindness and, and the severity, severity of yes. God is a balance to those who are doing good kindness. But you Christians are going to be cut off, Paul said, echoing this writer, if you don't remain within the kindness of God. Mm. Mm. So we're not talking about the, the, at least it seems to me that this writer is not talking about the, the boggles and uh, the, the mistakes that we make as Christians in our lives. Uh, we, we do err, and there is certainly a place and opportunity for forgiveness uh, and abundance oh, of forgiveness through Jesus certainly. Christ. But isn't this writer saying that, that once you have uh, actually been made clean by the blood of Christ. Now if we turn against him, against this, yeah. there remains no more sacrifice right. for sin. Where are you going to go now for the forgiveness of your sins with God because you you have now actually turned against the very thing by which yes. you have been made. So uh, it's a question of willful, willful sinning, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. It's willfully is very strong there. Voluntary, yeah. deliberate, mm -hmm. willfully. I now reject God officially. Mm -hmm. And that would be to go back on your baptismal vows. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's, it does not need to be said that water baptism is part of the system here. Mm -hmm. He talked about your body being washed and your conscience. That's exactly the mm -hmm. same language as Peter mm -hmm. on water baptism. So water baptism for intelligent adults upon reception of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus and so on is taken for granted. Mm -hmm. We don't sure. certainly need another division where water baptism becomes a sort of optional extra. That's never yeah. a discussion in the New Testament, mm -hmm. ever. Baptism into Jesus Christ was part of the new program, wasn't no it? No question. This new way, this new and living way. Since yeah. Jesus himself was baptized, you know, it, it's obvious that he's the model here. It should never be an argument. Unfortunately, division again occurs when mm. people come up with their own individual mm -hmm. uh, presentations of an easy doctrine that shouldn't be questioned. Sure. Yeah. Verse 32. But remember the former days when, after being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of sufferings, partly by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations, and partly by becoming sharers with those who were so treated. For you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. I really like that. Yes. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. For yet in a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. Verse 38, but my righteous one shall live by faith and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Verse 39, But we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. I like the my soul reference to God in verse 38. Mm. quoting, Actually quoting a, a, a verse from Habakkuk about mm. faith. And yet in a very little while. So Habakkuk writing in Old Testament times, in a very little while, no, the day of the Lord. Well, it's been more than 2,000 mm -hmm. years now. So it's not a chronological measure exactly, but that end is coming. 
And uh, if you shrink back, you're in terrible shape. God's soul, I like that, my soul, God speaking, his self. God is a single self in Scripture. An individual, yes. An individual yes. divine, not a human person, obviously, yes. but he's a single divine self. Not one what in three who's, <laughs> yes. as I've heard said, but one who. Yeah. One single individual who. This is biblical monotheism. Right? And God then is a self. And I'm glad he's revealed himself in these easy terms to yes, us, you know, yes. not in the abstruse language of Greek philosophy, which is so terrifyingly complex and confusing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I really like, uh, you know, I was just thinking, as you were saying, this writer has set before us in this chapter, as we're coming to the, to the end of this chapter, he set before us, he set before his readers a, a just amazingly rich, full understanding oh, of so yeah. many wonderful things. Yes. And, uh, you know, he's starting out saying, don't, uh, don't be so enamored with the, the old system. He describes it as uh, shadows of not the real thing, just a foreshadowing of till the real thing comes into our vision and now we can, we can, uh, we can do that. You don't want to live in the shadows. You want to walk in the real, the real new living way. I like right. that. But then the uh, very uh, great uh, severity that attaches to then devaluing this new living way by the blood of Jesus Christ. It's, uh, it is it's a marvelous tremendous. piece, as you say, rich and profound and so much packed in. I mean, he does Christology, he does eschatology, all of the facets of Christian theology are here. And yet he gets a balance between severity and kindness. Mm -hmm. You know, there is a gentleness here, uh, exhorting as a father, and these terrifying warnings. And I'm, I'm reminded of Paul's phrase, the terror of God. You know, yes. there is an element of terror in God. Mm -hmm. Can't just take him for granted. He's not just a paternal uh, father figure up there, an old man with a gray beard. You know, fatherly fellow. Right, <laughs> who tells you it doesn't matter yes, what right. you do as long as you're sincere, that's it's right. fine, you know. Mm -hmm. No, we're supposed to r grapple and, and gain the truth and li 